The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Can Ontario really get 1.5 million new homes built in a decade? Housing Minister Steve Clark is here to answer for his government's ambitious and controversial plan. Also, our Ontario hubs explain why Hamilton stopped waiting for cold weather alerts to open warming centres. And from solutions to homelessness in rural Ontario to confronting anti-Semitism, we've got the Agenda's Week in Review. It's Friday, January 27th, and that's all ahead on the Agenda. When introducing Bill 23, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, Steve Clark, said, the problem is clear. There simply aren't enough homes being built. And the solution is equally clear. We need to get more homes built faster. But if it's all clear to the minister, the debate that's ensued suggests that it's not as clear to others. So let's find out more. Here's Steve Clark. He is the PC MPP for Leeds Grenville, Thousand Islands, and Rideau Lakes. And we welcome you back to our studio. It's good to have you here. Glad to be back. Thanks. I guess I got to say two things off the top. Number one, before we get started, I got to do this full disclosure thing in the interest of transparency. It's worth noting my brother is a home builder and is developing a parcel of land that was just removed from the green belt in Grimsby, east of Hamilton. We put that on the record, number one. Sure. Number two, every time we get a cabinet minister here, I get lots of advice from people about, about the need to sort of beat them up. And I just want to say to everybody, my job is not to beat them up. My job is to ask the questions that you want asked. So we'll do that in a civilized fashion, as we always do on this program. Good to go? I'm good to go. The government has a goal of getting 1.5 million homes built over the next decade. Does your plan distinguish what kinds of homes those 1.5 should be? Social housing, market rates, rentals, owned condos, whatever. Yeah, it does, Steve, and, and we were very clear right from the start, right from the very first housing supply action plan, More Homes, More Choice, which was the last time I came on the program, mm -hmm. we put a plan in place that would build all types of housing, every type, shape, form, price range. Uh, over the last three years, we've been very responsive to municipal needs. We've spent uh, about $4.4 .4 billion on our community housing system through various iterations of the social services relief fund and COVID supports. Um, but we still have a housing shortage. And the housing supply action plan that we're promoting, the, the most recent one, More Homes Built Faster, builds upon the success, but it really recognizes the urgency of the housing supply action plan. We went to the, the people in the election in June, talked about our plan, which was a, a very aggressive plan to build 1.5 million homes over the next 10 years by 2031. And uh, it's, it's going to cause and, and, and cause us as a government to make some very bold um, decisions. Well, let's see how bold, because you won't be surprised to hear, we cover this story from time to yes. time on this program. And a lot's been said in the media, of course, about why you decided to open the green belt after initially saying that you wouldn't. Last week, we had the mayor of Newmarket, Mayor Taylor, on the program, who asked the following. Sheldon, if you would. If this was about housing affordability, truly about housing affordability, I don't support taking land into the green belt. But if you do, and if you're going to do it, philosophically, you believe it's the right thing to do, why are there not density targets tied to it? Why are there not transit-oriented development requirements tied to it? And why, if you're handing billions of dollars over to landowners in one a legislative change, why were there not housing affordability criteria and targets directly tied to that land? Answer, please. There were. Um, I was surprised at, uh, at Mayor Taylor's comments because he insinuated that we, we didn't provide targets. We made it crystal clear when we made the announcement that we expect to have, as a minimum, 50,000 homes being built from those 15 properties. The fact that we made it crystal clear that, as a minimum, 10% of those units had to be affordable and attainable. And we very clearly said to those 15 um, um, development companies, the fact that they needed to work with local councils, they needed to create uh, complete communities, they needed to ensure that um, at, a, at a minimum that they reflected uh, the priorities of those communities, which, which aren't just single family homes. So exactly. And then the final thing um, was we said that if there's not substantial completion 
uh, in terms of, of housing starts on these properties, that I would return them back to the green belt, we'd repost them, we'd put them back in, just as we posted to get them out. Let me dive deep on this one number here. 10% had to be affordable. How are you defining affordable housing here? Well, uh, in, in, in More Homes Built Faster, there, there is a definition that says that affordability is 80% uh, of the rental uh, price um, that had to be 80% of the market rent. Uh, on a sale price, it had to be 80% of the average sale price. Um, and guaranteeing that the development company made it affordable for 25 years. That's in the act, more homes built faster. However, we're open, as I said, at the uh, Roma conference. Rural, earlier, rural, rural Ontario Municipal. Rural Ontario Municipal Association, as I said earlier in the week. Mm -hmm. um, we want to work with municipalities. We want to ensure that the changes that we've put forward in Bill 23, where we've said we want to incent uh, affordable, attainable, um, inclusionary zoning, Nonprofit uh, and purpose-built rental. We want to. We want to make sure that we get the definition right. The last thing okay, we can, can I... afford to do as a government is to have an affordability definition that doesn't fit our municipal partners. So let's let's uh, go a little deeper on that then. If if it's if if you're using market rates right now to define affordable as opposed to a percentage of income, which it has traditionally been. Are we getting further ahead or further behind here? Because most people's definition of what's considered affordable has a relationship to how much money they make, not what the market says. Yeah, but, but I also think that it's very important that... Is that a fair we, point? You're going to give me that? I'm going to give it to you, but, okay. I, but I also want to counter by saying um, the Housing Affordability Task Force that the government appointed, that I appointed, that gave me their report almost a year ago, mm -hmm. talked about the costs of doing business. It, it, it takes too long to build housing in Ontario, and the costs are too high. The average uh, uh, extra costs that fees and other charges add to a house in the GTA is about $116,900. That's too much. It ultimately results in a 20-year mortgage for a young couple to be another $800 on their mortgage. That's too high. So the principle of Bill 23 is to lower those uh, input costs uh, so that it's not that as expensive and ultimately the hope is that the cost for housing would be cheaper. So yes, we have to continue to work with municipalities on what the definition of attainable and affordable. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that everyone's clear on on the discounts for purpose-built rental, the discounts for nonprofit, because we've got some great nonprofit partners out there that want to build affordable homes, that want to make sure people can afford that mortgage. Um, but, but again, We've got a severe problem. Sure. Well, yeah. let me let me follow up on the municipal partner angle because you, I mean, I heard you say it at Roma the other day. You've said it during our conversation here today. You want to work with municipalities to make sure that you guys all get to the promised land. However, we have heard Mayor Taylor was one. We have have had others on this program as well, who uh, don't love the fact that you don't appear to be. I don't know if listening is the right word, but taking into account the suggestions that they've got. Uh, we know in the city of Hamilton, for example, you've overridden plans as it relates to uh, the boundary there about where development can or cannot take place. How are you going to get municipal partners on board when you disagree with them and or are fighting with them on such key issues? Well, part of our job is to ensure that we've got a plan in place. And I've, I've, been, I've been very clear with mayors when we've had meetings with either myself or uh, in conjunction with the premier, like the meetings we had uh, early in, in 2021 uh, and 2022, uh, you know, we, we need to ensure that official plans, which are the, really the playbook for uh, our cities and towns and townships and regions, we need to ensure that they reflect the plan that we took to the people. The fact that we want to make sure everyone has uh, all of the tools that they need to get 1.5 million homes. The, using Hamilton as an example, the council overruled some very thoughtful recommendations from their staff that we changed as part of You're the a politician. official plans. You're a politician. You would acknowledge that an elected council has the right to overrule staff. But again, staff advise. But again, I've got a challenge that is very difficult to deliver on. Mm -hmm. 1.5 million homes over a 10-year period, extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. The best year we had in our province's history was in 2021, best in 30 years, 100,000 starts. Last year, we're just under 100,000. You can do the math. You're better in math than I am. We need at least 150,000 
starts per year, and that's not with the new immigration targets that we know since the federal government has announced that the majority of those new Canadians are going to come to Ontario. Yep. So yep. we need to act quickly and decisively, and I acknowledge that, uh, that some of our municipal partners might feel we're moving a little faster mm -hmm. than they're able to handle. Okay, we heard from Mayor Taylor a second ago. I want to play a clip from another mayor. This is, this is a tweet, rather, from Aurora's Mayor Tom Marrakis, who said, the current provincial policy approach does not account for the reality that housing options and affordability needs differ across communities, as do the solutions needed to address these issues. And those solutions need to be grounded in evidence-based policy. Is he onto something? Well, uh, we had a, a, a panel of experts our housing affordability task force that looked at the continuum of housing. And as I said earlier, it takes too long to get shovels in the ground. The mix is, is, is not what we need right now. So we embedded into more homes built faster, uh, a regime of development charge, either elimination or reduction that will incent the type of housing that mayors like Mayor Maracas Mayor Taylor and others who have been on your show uh, have indicated needs to get done. But we have to acknowledge, and I think Mayor Maracas needs to acknowledge, that all three levels of government need to have a role in this. It's just not a role at the federal and provincial level to do this financially. We need to all have a, some skin in the game. And, and quite frankly, you know, a mayor has to be able to look that young family in the face and give them some hope. Right now, some of the mayors are not giving that young family hope that they'll ever have a home that meets their needs and their budget. Do you think he I is? Want, I want to make sure that we give them that hope. And, Do you think and, he is? Well, I, you know, I, I think that it's the average house price in Aurora is pretty high but, still. But it's challenging uh, when some mayors, um, you know, already indicate that they believe taxes are going to increase because of more homes built faster mm -hmm. when, when they know that we're still collaborating with them on making them whole, on assessing the actual cost. And, and at Roma, the Rural Ontario Municipal Association Conference this week, I talked about the importance of having a select group of municipalities audited to make sure that some of the claims that mayors like Mayor Maracas make are actually true. And, and you know, the mayor of Waterloo was on your show last week, mm -hmm. uh, used a, an entire development charge figure uh, multiplied it by five and said that that was the revenue that was going to be lost for the community. That's not true. That is, that is, it's that not is, true because it's not true because not every development in that community is going to be eligible for a development charge exemption. Right. So when a mayor uses their entire DC budget and says they're going to lose all this money, that's not factually correct. And, and again, my pledge this week to municipalities and my pledge to them earlier um, this year was that we wanted to work with them. We need to assess the actual um, shortfall that they um, are projecting. Just so people are clear here, because you're not exempting development charges on all development. No, it's no, on no. some development. Some development. But they are making, in your judgment, they're making it sound like it's a blanket S some statement. Are. Yeah. Some are. Some are. Some yeah. aren't. You know, yeah. I, I think the vast majority of municipal officials we met with face to face this week were, were very open. Um, in fact, some of them wanted us to go farther on things, for example, like purpose built rental. Where, where a, a council you know, really needs that. But I, I want to also make something clear that deferring and exempting development charge, this isn't something that is a new concept that I just rolled out of bed the other day and thought of myself. Municipalities have been doing this for years. I, I, can, I can point you in the direction of many municipalities who are incenting affordable housing or incenting nonprofit housing like Habitat for Humanity Homes, who are already doing exactly what is in More Homes Built Faster. Um, it's just not being made mandatory as I'm doing with this piece of legislation. The question might be, why am I making it mandatory? It's because of the severity of the housing supply crisis. Everything we're doing, we're doing with a lens of how we can get shovels in the ground faster and how we can have a plan in place, given a very challenging economy right now, that when the economy takes an uptick, that we can get shovels in the ground and actually get those starts up over 100,000 a year. Okay, why don't, uh, where am I gonna follow up here? I wanna ask you about another provision in Bill 23. 
if I understand it, it allows all houses in Ontario to be converted into triplexes, in theory. Do I understand this correctly? The square footage and height can't change even if it's a bungalow. Is that right? Yeah, so the Housing Affordability Task Force talked about um, four units as of right. Um, we started with one of my previous housing supply action plans. We uh, allowed uh, municipalities to put policies in place to create like a granny suite in the basement or a laneway home uh, or other ancillary building, a dwelling unit on top of the property. Mm -hmm. What we found was two years later, not very many municipalities took advantage of that. So we, we decided to, to pick a midpoint between what the housing uh, affordability task force recommended and what we tried to encourage through a previous piece of legislation. And that's why we, we chose the three. So we, we wanted to keep the same footprint uh, in the neighborhood, but you know really try to incent the opportunity to create that additional apartment, uh, that, uh, that addition um, that would be a, a, another dwelling unit, or in some cases, uh, like cities like this, uh, a laneway or garden home that someone could. This intensification, I think, provides uh, a real unique opportunity in communities, both large and small. Will it happen, though? Is it actually going to happen, I, this I, intensification? I, I'm hopeful and optimistic that it will. We, we saw when I, when I gave municipalities the right to do it on their own that they were painfully slow in doing it. Um, I think the, the decision we've made uh, as part of More Homes Built Faster will will get it done. And again, we went to the people and said that under the leadership of Premier Ford, a re-elected government, um, all of our uh, part, all of our team, we were going to have a housing supply action plan every year of our four years. So that's really the piece that our team. No, know, I get it. You got reelected, and in fact, the opposition has given you some political cover on this. They want you to do this too. I mean, Mike Schreiner's, Mike Schreiner was on our program when just the other day, uh, proposing Bill 44, which would allow for four stories in some and, and yeah. in transit areas, six stories even, um, six to eleven, I think. If it's got I mean, it seems to have broad political support, so why not power forward with it? Well, I, you know, I think some of our municipal colleagues just, just aren't there yet. And, and I said that when the Housing Affordability Task Force tabled their report last February. We, we made it very clear that that report is going to be our long-term roadmap as a government. Um, every year of our mandate, we are going to continue to implement those measures. But I, I was very open with Ontarians last February that said our municipal partners just aren't ready. And I think the last bill has sort of proved that uh, I was right. In which case, I think this is a fair question, um, you know, did you bring a knife to a gunfight? And by that I mean, you know, you've described this as a crisis, the situation, both in terms of quantity and affordability. Do you believe you, and, and I keep hearing you use the word bold, but you know, have your actions truly been bold enough given what you seem to be suggesting we're facing right now? Well, all of our team, and I, and I mean, you know, our associate minister, Michael Parsa, my parliamentary assistant, Kevin Holland, all three of us uh, are all focused on measures that we can do to improve uh, housing opportunities in Ontario. There's not one silver bullet. There's not one measure that the government of Ontario can do that just magically solves the housing supply crisis. For sure. So we need to build upon it. How long uh, will it take? Uh, you know, I, th I think it's a, I can't really say how many years I think it will take, but I do believe that the next 10 years are going to be critical for our government, our municipal partners, and also the federal government uh, to get a plan in place that is collaborative, connected, and um, we're going to continue as a, as a provincial partner to, uh, to, to work with both sides. You spent a lot of time working on the supply side of housing, telling us you want to get stuff built. The feds, who are more responsible, I guess, on the demand side of things, have there been any discussions with them about, for example, immigration targets related to new housing, that kind of thing? Yeah, we, not, not on the immigration targets, like mm -hmm. as it relates to housing. We, we know, you know, the Premier's been very open uh, that he feels the 500,000 new Canadians that uh, we'll welcome to the country, the majority of them are going to be coming to Ontario. They will and, come here. And, and we already have a... Uh, housing supply crisis. My, my task force last year 
uh, picked that 1.5 million homes. CMHC shortly after said that it might be closer to 1.7. So again, it, 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 it's a challenge that the government needs to, to take head on. We do need a, a federal partner. Um, do you have one? Uh, we, you know, we do. I, I, I think there's a. I think there's an opportunity for um, the federation to understand that on the housing space, um, we have a bit of a, a challenge. Uh, this isn't something that a 38% per capita uh, ratio is going to fix. I, I go to meetings with my federal, provincial, and territorial colleagues. Our core housing need, Steve, is so much higher than every other province and territory. When we start talking about um, some of the initiatives we're doing, even something like my by name list that I'm working with my service managers to identify you know, people who are homeless or at risk of homeless, our core housing need is just so much higher than everybody else. And, and the challenge we've had uh, is getting the, the federal government to recognize that. Obviously, my provincial and territorial colleagues aren't enthused about they're not sympathetic giving, to your situation giving me at all. some of their money yeah. so that I can deal with it but I do think that it's a that it's a challenge especially on some of the new programs the federal government are rolling out the accelerator fund mm -hmm. which is critical to connect with municipalities and you heard earlier this week um, their their concern about infrastructure but also the rent to own program uh, the purpose built rental side uh, I, we really need to to dive in on how much the federal government is is providing. And I really do think if, regardless of what they do with the other national housing strategy dollars, if we could get an enhanced uh, intake for rent to own or, or the accelerator fund, it would go very far in terms of helping municipalities and the province build more affordable housing and more affordable rents. I'm going to ask you one last question, uh, and uh, you know, we'll give you the heads up. This is going to be a bit of a nasty question, but here we go. I appreciate that in your zeal as Minister of Housing, you want to get stuff built. There are currently at least two that I know of investigations underway by the Integrity Commissioner and the Auditor General as to whether or not, in your zeal to get stuff built, you gave a heads up to rich developers in York Region so that they could purchase land that was in the Greenbelt with the knowledge that it would soon be out of the Greenbelt and therefore developable. I know you've answered this question outside the studio, but I want to give you a chance to speak to it on the record here. Absolutely not. Absolutely not, Steve. Uh, at no time did that, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, allegation happen. Uh, I'm pleased that the Integrity Commissioner dismissed uh, the Green Party um, complaint against the Premier and I that uh, he felt that we benefited financially, which the Integrity Commissioner dismissed outright. Yes, there's another Integrity Commissioner investigation uh, and an Auditor General um, um, value for money audit. Mm -hmm. and, and, and at no time did we tip anybody off to use the, the, the words that the Premier said. Uh, but I want to be clear that the best value for money on the, what we've done as a government is to make sure that those 50,000 homes at a minimum get built. We need them. Ontarians need them. Young families need them. And we need to ensure that we continue to do everything we can to get shovels in the ground so that we can provide better housing affordability for our province. You're confident that denial you just gave us is not going to come back to I bite am, you on I, the backside. I, I, I am confident, Steve. Very confident. That's Steve Clark. He's the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing and the PC member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands, and Rideau Lakes, the longest riding name in the province. Minister Clark, always good to have you here. Thanks, Thanks so Steve. much for taking our questions. Thank you so much. In many cities and towns in Ontario, it takes a cold weather alert to open warming centres for those without adequate housing or shelter. Justin Chandler covers Hamilton Niagara for Ontario Hubs. He's been looking into how well that works and joins us now from Hamilton. Hello, Justin. Hey, Jan. All right, so why are warming centres needed in the first place? Well, warming centres are needed in the first place because a lot of uh, municipalities don't have the necessary social supports to keep uh, everybody housed at one time. And so when it gets really cold, for example, in Hamilton, where there are about 500 shelter spaces and about 1,500 people who are unhoused at any time, um, there's a mismatch. So people don't have enough beds to stay in. The shelter system is often at about 100% uh, capacity. Uh, so warming centers are opened up so that people can get some reprieve from the cold uh, without necessarily uh, bed to sleep, just to you know, essentially prevent people from freezing to death outside. 
All right, I'm gonna speak for myself and say, whenever I get a cold weather alert or something on my phone, I simply look at it and it really means nothing. It just means, you know, wear a hat, wear a jacket. Uh, but weather alerts do trigger uh, the opening and closing of warming centers. How does that actually work? Yes, and I'll just add the caveat that it does depend on the municipality or the jurisdiction that we're talking about. Um, but here in Hamilton, for example, um, this is starting to change. Um, but the, the procedure has been that when it hits minus 15, the medical officer of health issues a cold weather alert, and that triggers the opening of warming centers, uh, which are partially um, community centers, uh, select libraries, these open um, and allow people to come in to warm up. And then uh, it also means that overnight warming centers are activated. And there's currently one of those in Hamilton, and it was recently changed so that uh, it'll actually be open every night, regardless of uh, the temperature. Um, but in Toronto, it's still the case, uh, like in Hamilton, with that minus 15 threshold that uh, this has to be activated in order for it to open. I think we all agree minus 15 is incredibly cold. And I want to talk about uh, one of the scientists you spoke to, Public Health Ontario scientist Hong Chen, uh, gave you some troubling statistics on the relationship between death and cold temperatures. What did he exactly say? Yeah, this is based off of a Public Health Ontario report uh, that some scientists led. And uh, they found that for each five degree drop in the daily average temperature uh, in Ontario, this is based off of uh, coroner's reports over the years, there was a 3% increase in non-accidental deaths persisting over a week. So basically seven deaths a day for every uh, five degree drop in average temperature. Uh, so that doesn't mean five degree drop to like minus 15 to minus 20. It just means the temperature goes down uh, and deaths increase. Now, in your article, you, you sort of looked at the research and, and sort of, you know, there have been arguments about whether or not these thresholds actually are based on anything. And your, your research suggests that common thresholds aren't based on science. What happens to the body when it's fighting off cold temperatures? Yes, uh, Dr. Chen told me that uh, really cold weather has uh, some pretty serious effects on uh, your cardiovascular system. Uh, so that's the, one of the reasons that cold weather effects last so long, is that it creates this strain on people's hearts, uh, and that can lead to heart attacks and strokes later on. Uh, and then, of course, there's the general cold weather risk of uh, frostbite and hypothermia for people who are out in the cold for prolonged periods of time. Um, but the reason uh, that this might not be exactly linked to uh, cold weather alerts necessarily is um, if you look at, for example, some research that came out of the MAP Center for Urban Health in Toronto, uh, they found that 72% of hypothermia cases in unhoused people, this was again in a review of uh, emergency department uh, admissions and uh, deaths, uh, occurred at above minus 15. So Toronto has this minus 15 negative uh, cold threshold. And that's actually not when the majority of people are starting to face these negative effects. A lot of those are happening before it ever gets that cold. All right, uh, you had mentioned that uh, different municipalities have sort of different thresholds. Um, are temperature thresholds different in northern parts of this province uh, compared to the south? Yes, and that's uh, for a couple of reasons. So partially is, uh, you know, like I said, every jurisdiction has its own uh, plan. Toronto and Hamilton both use that minus 15 threshold. And again, I'll note that Hamilton's uh, might be in the process of changing soon. Um, but other municipalities use entirely different thresholds uh, based on their own resources as well. Um, and then we also have Environment Canada it cold thresholds. So this is where it gets a little bit confusing, but it, effectively Environment Canada issues warnings. And this is probably what you get uh, on your phone for the most part um, when temperatures are extremely cold. Um, and these do change depending on where you are in the province. And uh, a warning preparedness a meteorologist at Environment Canada told me that this is because in some parts of, for example, Northern Ontario, people are a little bit more used to the cold. The threshold there is uh, minus 40 for that sort of alert. Uh, and in South Central Ontario, it's minus 30. So those are based though more around when extreme cold is a hazard. Um, whereas these municipal alerts and the things that connect to warming centers, there's the health component, but there's also the resource component and sort of the political component as to when exactly this uh, threshold is going to be activated. 
I, I want to ask a follow-up on that in terms of the resourcing and sort of that argument with this threshold. You know, there's a lot of conversation about why are we waiting until minus 15, you know, when minus 10 is just as cold and your, your data supports that is. Can you give us an example? I believe in the city of Hamilton, there's been some progress. Uh, Andrew Horvath, the mayor there, uh, made some changes to the warming centers, at least for this winter. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yes, there was an incident uh, over the holidays. It was uh, quite well publicized uh, in the city where uh, on Christmas Eve, actually, during a, a big snowstorm, a uh, cold alert was ended because it was above minus 15. And what that meant was that an overnight warming center in the city, uh, the city's only overnight warming center, was no longer going to be funded. Um, and so the, the person who directs the center, it's called The Hub, and uh, Jennifer Bonner, who's the director there, uh, posted about this online, and that brought a lot of attention and donations uh, so that the center was eventually able to open. Um, and the city ended up saying, you know, a lot of people are calling this a policy failure. That's the words that one councillor used. Um, and we need to change things so that if it's still really cold, you know, minus 10, minus 15, still high risk for people to get to hypothermia, um, that we're going to have more space for people to go. So uh, things changed in Hamilton. Now there's going to be warming centers open every, uh, every night at the hub for the rest of uh, the winter. And the staff are currently looking at uh, trying to get more warming centers open. And then there's discussion about whether this will uh, continue after this so that there's more of a winter response rather than an alert-based response. All right, one person you spoke to called this situation a Band-Aid on top of a Band-Aid. Uh, ultimately, this is really a conversation about uh, attainable housing or affordable housing. What are some of the solutions being considered? Yeah, well, I mean, it starts with uh, affordable housing, and that, that quote was from uh, Dr. Stephen Huang, who, who's with the MAP Center, who did that uh, research regarding hypothermia that I mentioned before. Um, and th that's his quote, because he said that uh, really what we need is affordable housing. We do not have enough affordable housing, so we put forth emergency shelters. That's a Band-Aid. Um, and then we don't have enough emergency shelters. Like I mentioned at the beginning, there's not enough for all the unhoused people um, in a lot of cities. Um, and so warming, shelter, or warming centers are a Band-Aid on top of that. So what he said uh, we need to do, uh, number one, is create more housing. But in the meantime, uh, come up with more warming spaces and more shelter spaces. Uh, so essentially, create more of those Band-Aids until we can uh, fix the injury. Justin, great stuff. Thank you for your reporting. You take care. The agenda this week sat down with MPP Lisa McLeod about her struggles with mental health, got a primer on Canadian tax policy, and considered the persistence of anti-Semitism. The agenda's week in review begins at this week's Rural Ontario Municipal Association's annual conference with ideas on how to deal with homelessness and acute housing needs in smaller centres around the province. In terms of individuals experiencing homelessness, I'm sure many have heard, heard the stats or the costs. Um, you're spending anywhere from ninety dollars to $200,000 per person per year that's on the street. Mm. Or you can spend a third of that, a quarter of that, possibly even a tenth of that on providing the basic needs of an individual. We went from having a little bit of pushback in that town to three months after we were opened. The OPP, the superintendent of Northwestern Ontario, was calling us, telling us that calls were down 90%, that ambulances weren't going to the hospital with people who needed a prescription for housing. Um, and then we had the local taxpayers' federation saying, you guys are saving us money on OPP and ambulance billbacks. So we know this works. You either, you either invest in preventative me measures or you pay a whole lot more in reactive measures. So that's one from a, from a local perspective. Um, second, second from an international perspective, and I have no connection to Scotiabank here, but if you, if you have the time, read the report they released last week they're calling, this is a big five bank, calling on Canada to double the amount of social housing that we have in this country. We are presently at half the level of social housing as our other G7 counterparts. Scotia Bank is now saying, and this is where it's more, more powerful, right? Where, where everyone in this room knows that housing is, is the solution to homelessness. Housing is the solution to, to getting people off of the street. 
Now when we have a big five bank in Canada, economists saying it is much cheaper for governments in the long run to invest in housing because they're saying, which we know, market, market economics 101, supply and demand, it does not provide, markets do not provide housing for everyone. It provides housing for those who are willing and, willing and able to, uh, to pay that price. But it invariably leads to, quote, market failures, textbook term. That means that not everyone will be served by the market. Scotiabank is saying it's cheaper for governments to invest in social housing than not over the long run. So we need to make those partnerships with, with people that, and organizations that maybe we haven't in the past. But so when you get this sort of, you know, this push at the municipal level saying we need to, we need to invest better, we need to be proactive in our investments, we need to take care of people first and foremost, and then to, to Brenda's point about the financial side, when you get Bay Street economists saying, housing makes sense, do it. Why aren't we doing it? Let's do it. There's your consensus. Let's, um, <laughs> Marilyn, I am told that uh, municipalities in the province of Ontario have a lot more responsibilities and carriage of the housing issue than, say, other municipalities in other provinces in Canada. And I guess I want to know from you if that's a blessing or a curse. <laughs> Uh, to me, anything that devolves power and control down to a community is a blessing. But that said, I mean, there's lots been spoken to about the, the need for partnerships across different levels of government. And what I wa really want to say in response to my colleagues um, is that the financialization of housing in Canada is a system. We have a system of, of how you own a home and whether you can rent, rent a home, um, whether in fact you're in social housing. That's a financial system. And when you look for innovation at a systems level, I know when our, our group, as a collaborative group of municipal councillors and housing advocates <clears throat> and uh, nonprofits and business, people said, when do we put the shovel in the ground? Let's get the shovel in the ground. And in innovation process, it's about stopping and understanding what the interventions are in the system that makes the difference. So we have in, in Ontario, speak just in Ontario, a system that create, it's de is designed to create exactly the results we've got. It can't do anything else. It has, it has produced what we built that system to do. And it has failed. It has failed. And the fallout from that failure will be enormously felt at the community level. And so it's really interesting, you know, in our work we found it just fascinating to think, what is the leverage of a municipality? How do we bring collaboration to bear, municipality by municipality and between municipalities, as well as across other levels of government? Because that's where we, we, that's where we live and that's where the fallout is. Brian, can I check that line with you? We have a system that has failed. Do you agree with that? I would agree with that, um, especially if we focus on, on the, just the capital side alone. Um, and for the points I made earlier, across much of rural Ontario, housing was built um, based on a, a, an ideology. Like uh, we had uh, you know, heavy immigration in, in the mid-1900s, uh, mid-1900s. And it was a, a goal of people to own their plot of land, single detached home, be able to cut their grass, suburbs expanded. Um, and that system no longer is what is required in, in Ontario at large. And it's very difficult to work within that. I mean, we've seen the initiatives recently, right, about secondary suites, zoning changes. I mean, you gotta wonder what that looks like five, 10 years from now when we, we build that capacity inside our existing system. So I, I would agree with that. And I'd extend the point to say that when we're talking about homelessness, there's a part of the system that we don't acknowledge, and that is, uh, to Brenda's point, about the supports that have to be in place. And it's difficult across all of Northern Ontario to deliver those supports through a system that's already struggling through capacity problems. Can I follow up on that? There, there, are, there are people in, in the South here who, on a routine basis, stumble across homeless people in their daily lives you can walk outside this very hotel and run into it. And it's, well, I hope it's still considered shocking for people to see this. I'd hate for people to be inured by this. But people down south may not think that that 
That kind of homelessness exists in the North. Does it? It didn't. And uh, within the last 10 years, we never thought on the streets of Hearst or Timmins that we would see people on the streets at minus 30 degrees. But it is happening. It is happening tonight. Uh, and the emergency shelters that we put in place um, don't have the capacity to deal with it. And an emergency shelter is no kind of solution. I mean, it's a solution to save somebody's life tonight if they choose to stay in the shelter. But, I mean, most of rural Ontario is not equipped, even though we received some modest funding from the province to be able to deliver emergency supports, that's not the kind of support that's going to end homelessness. And until, I say this uh, uh, with some experience, until ending homelessness becomes a priority for education, health care, solicitor general, we will be chasing it. 99%, if not 100% of our homelessness strategies are reactive. It's to what's happening on the street tonight. No one is thinking about early childhood education, uh, parenting programs, nutrition programs, um, what to do to keep uh, the youth that are in First Nations um, from becoming addicted and then on the streets in, in our municipalities. So, uh, I mean, I... Uh, at the risk of taking up the next 38 minutes. I mean, I could talk about what needs to happen in the relationship between First Nations and municipalities and, and how the province and the feds continue to block that relationship. But it really maybe is, another time. Well, it's, it, sounds, it really is a case of, you know, pay me now or you can pay me later. Right. And if you pay me later, you're going to pay a lot more. In Lennox and Addington, do you have a homelessness problem? Absolutely. Absolutely. All of our rural areas do. What does it look like? It looks in some of the more, I'll say, urban, like in the town setting. There, we have a shelter in Napanee, for example, um, Morning Star Mission. They're doing a great job. It's sort of a warming center, but now it's become more of a shelter. Um, but there's a lot of folks that are just sleeping couch to couch or staying in abusive relationships because they have no place to go or undesirable situations because they have no choices. And I worry that it exacerbates their addiction issues because for some of them, Showing up with a bottle of booze is their way they get to sleep on somebody's couch. You know, like it's 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 a cycle. You need housing to support mental health and addictions supports, but you need mental health and addiction supports so that someone can maintain their housing so that they don't get evicted. I, I worry that some communities think and some residents think, oh, a shelter, that's gonna solve everything. Shelter's not gonna solve much of anything, because it, the very conditions that make you homeless in the first place, the mental health and addictions issues that make you homeless, are the same conditions that prevent you from even entering a shelter. Like For example, you can't take drugs into a shelter, and if you're not willing to part with your drugs at the door, you don't want to walk through the door. Mm -hmm. Or if your mental health conditions require like, you have a machete or a club and it goes wherever you go, you can't bring a weapon into the shelter. Those people are still on the street, and then our taxpayers say, oh, you're not doing enough. They're still homeless on the street. The shelter must be you know, overcrowded. Well, no, it's just those people can't see themselves to get through that door. We need to provide the support so that they can support them so that they can then access the supports that we want to provide. Let's go back. At what point did you start to think to yourself, Lisa, something is wrong and I need some help? Well, truthfully be told, I think it was probably during the minority parliament um, between 2011 and 2014. And the only reason I say that now is I recognize I was losing my hair. And uh, I was probably in a state of mania, but um, I definitely knew between 2014 and 2016 I was dealing with depression. And then in my first year uh, as a minister in government, it took, taking on a number of complex files that were very controversial. Um, Autism. It, uh, it uh, ended me up um, visiting um, the Ottawa hospital and, and getting in touch with a psychiatrist and dealing with a whole host of issues, which I'm still dealing with now. Um, having said that, after a, you know, a couple of years, um, and in particular dealing with uh, a, a very serious crisis during the election, um, it was really high time that I had to understand exactly what I have. I knew it wasn't unipolar um, depression. Uh, I knew it couldn't just be attributed to some of the trauma from around the clock police protection. Um, my mood wasn't stable. 
and uh, I, I had some very serious self-harm thoughts. So um, that's when, you know, working with, uh, a, a, you know, honestly, a team, my, my family physician, um, my, my family, uh, some very people that are close to me, a psychiatrist, uh, understood that, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm bipolar. Um, or as Frank Sinatra would say, 18 karat max depressive. Uh, so, so um, you're always allowed to, to quote Frank Sinatra on this show. We I'm okay, thank you. And so then I just thought, okay, here we are. Uh, I've got a diagnosis now. This magic pill, whatever they're going to give me, in my case, lithium, uh, is just going to cure me. And then that it doesn't work either because you know you have to. You're, it really is. Um, a cocktail that works for you and only you. It wouldn't work what works for me for you. And so over the last several months, it's been trying to find that right, um, you know, prescription or cocktail or uh, medicine and, and quantity that will stabilize me and put me on the path to success. The, co the convention, I mean, it's inter interesting is the wrong word. Unexpected, maybe. It's unexpected, I think, for people who watch Queen's Park to think that you would be going through this because you've always been considered one of the toughest customers down there, right? You really bring it during question period and you are a tremendous performer. And I'm wondering at some point, did you say to yourself, you know, damn it all, I'm Lisa McLeod. I can't be going through this. I am, I'm one tough customer. Well, look, I, I have to be very honest. I, I'm very angry that I have to deal with this because um, I told you I may cry, but you know, I didn't get elected in 2006 at 31 years old and say, oh, on my bingo card, I'm gonna have a massive meltdown and uh, you know, end up in hospitals trying to figure out what I have. Um, I simply didn't. I, I really enjoyed my time in the cabinet. I enjoyed my time in the front bench in opposition. I love being at community events, but some days I can't get out of bed. And, you know, that's, that's really tough. And can you imagine, like, the worst nightmare for a politician, especially when you're going into your sixth campaign? You're actually in the middle of an election campaign with your psychiatrist taking layers of you away and trying to de-politicize you as a politician. And that's what happened to me, you know, for my own health and safety and for the well-being of my family, I was going through the last two weeks of that election campaign, learning how not to be a politician while I was competing to keep my job. Like, it just uh, was, it was hard. And, um, and then, of course, you have all the noise around you, right? The, the social media, and then, then you're not responding to media. And so everything just starts to become this big pile, um, and this big mountain that is a burden on you. And you don't really know what the heck is going on. And we were still going, so you can't really tell anybody because you're still trying to figure out what is really wrong with me. And um, do you think you know now? Yeah, I mean, I think the diagnosis has been um, extremely helpful in the sense that I, I can I can see um, people who've succeeded with having the same diagnosis. I can see um, that there is a path forward uh, with medication and therapy. Uh, so I think that that's helpful, um, but there's a lot of uncertainty. 30 years since the Supreme Court case of Symes versus Canada. What was that case about? In some ways, it's a case about business deductions and what's a permissible business deduction. Mm -hmm. um, the meat of the case, though, is that it's about a lawyer who went to the Supreme Court arguing that her childcare expenses should be deductible from her business expenses. Um, that's groundbreaking because before that, no one had ever really tried to litigate this issue and think about whether or not childcare expenses are a valid business deduction. Um, children and business don't always mix, <laughs> so maybe I'll take a step back and explain why that might make sense. Sure. She was a lawyer, a partner at a law firm, and she argued that she could not be a partner at a law firm. She couldn't go to her job, she couldn't run this business, without actually having a nanny at home to care for her children. Who was therefore a legitimate business expense. And, and that was her argument. So uh, the test is, you know, is this something that is connected with your business and does it allow you to make a, a profit from your business? And so she argued, without this uh, nanny, I could not have gone to work. I could not have been 
a lawyer and I couldn't continue to run a business and earn income from my business, so it should be deductible. What did the court say about that? Uh, there were, at the time, as now, there were nine judges on the Supreme Court, seven men, two women. The men said it should not be deductible. The women said it should. No kidding. And so that's the law today. That's still the law today? Yes. Courts have uh, held that child care expenses are not legitimate business deductions, except to the extent that you get a small child care credit, whether or not you're an employee or a business owner, but you don't get to deduct a nanny salary, which would be a substantial hmm. part of your income. Let me do a little speculation here. There, there was a time not that long ago, we had four women and five men on the court, and the Chief Justice was female. Nobody thought about taking a new case before the court on this, given that change in demographic? I mean, maybe that, maybe that case would have been decided differently today, hmm. um, partly because, you know, we recognize for a lot of other types of expenses that there are personal elements and business elements. And so um, to the extent that there's a personal element, we often look at it in the context of how much does it relate to your business. So maybe it would have been decided differently today. But um, people are often talking about when they talk about, you know, oh, is, is there a distinction between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism in terms of the experience of, of people who are going through this. When a 15-year-old girl posts Shabbat Shalom on TikTok and then is flooded with trolls yelling, hashtag free Palestine, you B-I-T-C-H, there's nothing in that exchange that has anything at all to do with an actual place called Israel. And yet somehow we have feel obligated to pretend that it does. And there's, you know, when, when a synagogue is spray painted, you know, Zionist pigs, somehow we have to pretend that that's a conversation about Israel. To me, there's this very clear distinction between criticism of Israel, which is something all of us do for all of our countries, wherever we live, and demonization of a group of people. One looks like a conversation in a seminar room, and the other looks like throwing bottles at someone's head. And I don't really understand why we feel obligated to pretend that those two things are the same. Derek in Munich, do you want to come back on that? I don't think we are. Anybody in their right mind would say they're the same. Um, and I'm not talking about discussions in seminar rooms. I'm talking about very heated conversations that could happen really anywhere in society, very heated conversations about Israel, where people can have quite legitimate reasons to be extremely upset, even angry at Israel. And remember that angry speech, emotional speech about a country uh, is, is permitted speech. And what's happening with that poor 15-year-old girl um, is that she's being set upon thanks to the horrible technological innovations of social media, where a relatively small number of people can do tremendous damage uh, and of course, all the more so with the synagogue that gets vandalized or firebombed or the, the horrible shootings that have happened in synagogues in the United States and elsewhere in the world. These are perpetrated by a very small number of people, but the multiplier effect of their actions is enormous. Obviously, what these people are doing is hateful, anti-Semitic and criminal. There's no question about it. The question is, what do we do about the language about Israel, which is admittedly at times intemperate and unfair? People have a right to be prejudiced in, in that sense. People have a right to focus on certain parts of the world more than others. That's just, I mean, we, 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 we simply can't pay attention to all social evils equal. But what we have to then understand, this is not a matter of academic conversation versus everything else. This is a question of conversation in the public sphere everywhere about Israel. And when people can say quite negative or even nasty things about Israel, and they aren't immediately tarred as hating Jews. I think we could do several follow-ups on this angle here, but I'm mindful of the clock and the other things that I think we still need to get to. So I'm going to move on and Robert Yon bring you in on this. And again, I want to go back to the ADL study. Around 20% of Americans believe that Jews have too much power and influence. And I wonder if you believe, and again, a bit of an odd question, but here we go. Are Jews too visible in some aspects of society for their own good? <laughs> you know, which Jews? That's the first question, of course. 
Uh, it, it's very clear that that because of uh, well, let's first, first of all the, the the idea that Hollywood is dominated by Jews. Yeah, and in some way Hollywood has become the the big machine that not only represents America to itself, but also that represents America to the rest of the world. And it's historically true that because of a number of historical uh, historical uh, confluence of 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 of, of different 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 facts that Jews had at a certain moment and continue to have individual Jews, uh, uh, that they have a uh, quite important impact on, on basically the goings on in that town. But the question, of course, is do they do this as Jews? I mean, are they connected to some kind of, you know, uh, central agency that tells them what to think or what to do? And I think that, you know, the basic, the basic sad thing that's always said about Jews, you have two Jews and three opinions. Uh, that there is uh, that it's probably the, mo the least unified people in terms of opinions, and we can see this right now in this very conversation, that uh, there's an incredible amount of disagreement and variety. Uh, and that is also what Hollywood shows. I don't think that the fact that a number of important people like Spielberg and so on, they self-identify as Jews, are powerful, are influential in, in Hollywood, that that results in a uh, kind of Jewish agenda, sorry for, the, for uh, using this word, being imposed on, uh, on the American people. And that's just some of what we covered this week. You can find more, including the full conversations, on our website, tvo.org, our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed, that's twitter.com slash the agenda. And that's it for this Friday, January 27th, 2023. The tragic death of an Ontario provincial police officer, allegedly at the hands of a person out on bail, has triggered calls to reform the system. And on Monday, we'll take a closer look at that. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org. Have a great weekend, everybody, and we'll see you again on Monday. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.